You may have heard that Eminem released a new album recently. Although this is the rapper's first concept album in which he tells a continuous story, it is at its core largely what we've come to expect for the majority of it. Purposefully inflammatory statements wrapped in the packaging of an undeniable mastery of the English language. He's been doing this since the 90s, so nothing should really come as a surprise. I, as someone who grew up around white people who grew up around his music, have been listening to it for the majority of my life by now. And even still, I can't deny that my stomach turned and my heart dropped when I heard some of the things that were sprinkled across the first two thirds of the album, specifically the transphobic lines that were used by the infamous Slim Shady persona. And that's not to say that these are even among the top five or top ten most gruesome things to have been said across Eminem's discography. He's long since spoken openly about the gruesome murder and dismemberment of people and animals, among a laundry list of other topics that are far too exhausting to get into now. So what really made certain things offensive to me while certain things simply flew under the radar? I think it comes down to believability. For the uninitiated, over the course of his career, Marshall Mathers has developed three different personas or characters that exist within his music. There aren't really hard lines between the three as they do bleed into each other on most songs, but they're still relatively distinct. We of course have the notorious Slim Shady. This is who Marshall Mathers debuted himself as, the blonde haired blue-eyed, drugged-up killer who, by his own admission and through his own words, was sent by God to piss the world off. Second in line is Eminem. This is undoubtedly the truest name to his career. Eminem exists as a no-nonsense lyricist who exists simply to prove that he is the best at what he does, and anyone who wants to prove otherwise is welcome to try and almost certainly fail. Finally, we have the man behind the mask, so to speak, Marshall Mathers. This is, of course, his truest self, and only pops his head out on occasion, and almost exclusively on songs that were written for and to his daughter and other loved ones. I apologize for the backstory, but this will be important to understand what I'm talking about. The inciting incident that kickstarts the events of the album is Slim Shady kidnapping Eminem. Angry and abandoned, Shady claims that Eminem doesn't appreciate him or what he did for his career. The first bit of the album contains all of the antics that I described previously, as well as bits from the mind of Slim Shady about cancel culture, PC police, and Gen Z in general. This is, for lack of a better term, cringe, and more old man yells at cloud than anything meaningfully resembling commentary. As Eminem is drugged by Slim Shady and his hair is forcibly dyed back to the blonde that he used to be, every attempt is made to make Eminem see things his way. The world is fucked up now, it has you running scared of what to say. You need me so that we can fix it. Eventually, we reach the climax of the album in Guilty Conscience 2, a titular sequel to a song that Slim Shady made with Dr. Dre, where they played the metaphorical angel and devil on various individuals' shoulders. I'll pause for a moment and let you guess at which of the two Shady played. Fuck that, do that shit, shoot that bitch. Can you afford to blow this shit? I do that bitch. In the climax, we see Eminem play into Slim Shady's ego to convince Shady to untie him. Without having been successful, Eminem is able to wrestle a gun from Shady's hands and demands of him say you're sorry. Oh. You didn't any ah. of it. an apology. Eventually, with Shady unwilling, or perhaps unable by his very nature, to apologize, he's shot. The real Slim Shady finally lays down, and I think that's probably for the best. Marshall Mathers is not the first and will certainly not be the last artist to say the terrible things that they say are done by a character or done in jest in order to evade responsibility. Ultimately, it's up to the court of public opinion on whether or not these excuses are valid on a case-by-case -case basis. When I hear Shady say, quote, fuck blind people and deaf people suck, I don't even flinch because there's not a bone in my body that believes that the man behind the character actually believes in that statement. It's simply too outlandish, too absurd and obvious in its childishness. However, when that same character says, quote again, boy is Bruce generous, and I'm as much of a boy as Bruce Jenner is, I can't help but cringe and grow concerned about who I might be supporting, because it's much more believable in the world that we live in that a 50 year old man is transphobic than that he hates blind people. Both of these things are terrible, surely, but only one of them begs for some kind of clarification, and nothing ruins a joke more than explaining it. This is the fundamental problem with artists like Eminem, Dave Chappelle, Jeff Dunham, and more. While they exist on a spectrum of how much the average viewer believes that they believe in it, none of them are in a spot where they feel that they can make a clear statement about where the line of truth falls for them because it ruins the joke. It's an integral part of their chosen performance that you have to squint and strain and come to your own conclusions on what kind of a person they are. 
I don't think that these performers or any similar acts are stupid or unaware of what they're doing either. Most of them have been doing it for decades, and I would consider it impossible for them to be ignorant of the cause and effect unless deliberately so. It does however beg the question as to why these same people act surprised when they say terrible things and people get upset with them. There's a paradox of purposeful instigation and the response of, why are you angry, I was only joking. By feeling outraged at this genre of performer, you only succeed in feeding the Ouroboros its own tail. You lost the game and in doing so perpetuate it, no matter how much you hate it. Regardless of this, these people will still sell out stadiums if they choose to do so because by towing the line between a genuine asshole and a victim of cancel culture that just wants to make people laugh, they can have their hands in two pots if they maintain their balance on that tightrope for long enough. The safety net, of course, is that when you've been around for as long as they have, you will always have a core audience that has too much nostalgia to hold you accountable for what you do, because admonishing you would be an admonishment of their younger selves, and not everyone can stomach self-reflection. And so, with all of these elements, artists that are purposefully provocative can always exist with the right strategies. If it's all jokes, they can often get away with a lack of saying so because it would ruin said joke, and after all, you should know better. They shouldn't have to spell everything out for you, should they? And if what they say is genuine, then it requires no explanation. They are a bigot that gets you to laugh and pay them for being bigoted. An artist that achieves high enough highs to claim cancel culture is almost always immune to it because an audience still exists. They made their money and will continue to do so. Their fans only strengthened by the phantom of an idea that there is a them whom which should be united against. This feverishly increases loyalty in our tribal monkey brains and further insulates them from critique. As it was, and as it will continue to be, the Ouroboros eats its own tail, satiated. Another attribute that is often problematic is the kinds of people that tend to be fans of a particular artist. The old saying goes that you are the company that you keep, and while I simply do not believe the world to be as black and white as that, I do still think that the people that you surround yourself with do say something about you at the very least. So when you are an artist, what does the demographic of your viewers say about you? Again, while obviously not one-to-one, -one, if I personally notice that I attract a lot of homophobic people to my art, just as an example, I would think it would be worth examining what about my art seems attractive to such an unsavory crowd. Why do I appear like someone that welcomes people with that kind of hate within them? Freedom of expression is incredibly important, especially in the arts, as they are inherently vulnerable and personal things. I think there's a misconception between something receiving public disapproval and the idea that you can't say something or do something. If you paint a painting of fire and people say that they do not like to see paintings of fire, that should not be interpreted as them saying that you are not allowed to do so. Just don't be surprised when you are surrounded by unsold paintings and unhappy people. Nobody can force you to do anything, and any insinuation otherwise is willful ignorance at best and stirring the pot because you have nothing better to do at worse. I want to be clear and say that I do not necessarily mean to criticize or talk down upon anyone who is a fan of an artist of any kind that is considered controversial, so to speak. The media that you consume is your business, not mine. And I also want to say that I don't think that offensive art, quote unquote, is impossible to be done well. The last good thing on SNL is with Colin Joust and Michael Shea. I'm not going to show any of it here, but for the uninitiated, they often write jokes for one another and read them live on air without the other getting to see them ahead of time. Without fail, they will have each other say, objectively speaking, offensive things. More specifically, Michael will often write things for Colin that are racist towards black people. The reason that people are not calling for the firing of Colin should be obscenely obvious. There is no opaqueness to how he really feels. They've been doing this show for years together and everyone is in on the joke. Nobody has to be afraid that they're actually just watching a racist person be racist, and so we can laugh. If there's a takeaway in all of this, I want it to be that it's okay to be aware of the media that you consume. And, in addition to that, because of how much hate and strife there is in the world, it's also okay to sometimes turn your brain off and just laugh at some jokes, offensive or otherwise. But don't ever lose sight of what you actually believe in. Really make note of where the comedy ends and where your personal values begin, because they probably overlap a lot more than you may think. Don't be an asshole, and thanks for watching. Have a good day.